Okay, good afternoon. Peter, good afternoon. <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to, um, to welcome you to um, another of our, our continuing uh, policy-oriented discussions at um, seminars at the School of Public Affairs and Administration. Um, and today we are very fortunate. Okay, we'll keep talking. We're very fortunate to really be addressing the, the topic of bipartisanship, um, you know, trials and tribulations um, with um, Congressman Herbert Klein. Uh, but first, I'd like to ask our, our provost, Todd Clear, um, to really welcome the congressman to, to campus. So, Todd? Thank you, Mark. Um, um, and uh, uh, Congressman Klein, thank you for coming to visit us and to talk to us about uh, what may be the most important pressing public policy question we could ask. I mean, there's content questions, obviously, and we talk about them quite dramatically. And uh, we, every day we open up the newspaper and we are faced with another uh, question uh, about this policy issue or that policy issue. But we really are having trouble addressing them. Uh, and one of the reasons that why it is so difficult for uh, us right now to be able to take on the policy challenges in, uh, facing the country um, is that we have trouble being bipartisan. We have trouble crossing the, the aisle. And, um, and so I, I think we couldn't have a more timely topic and, uh, and a more timely uh, t uh, uh, idea for us to think about than this one. I want to congratulate the council on, um, first of all, uh, getting such a distinguished person to come and, and speak to us, and also for the work that you do. Rutgers University Newark, I mean, if you look around, you will see we are the future of what the United States uh, policy-making apparatus will look like uh, down the road. And our job is to figure out not how to make the policies of the future, but how to make ourselves ready to be engaged in the policy-making of the future. And that's what the School of Public Administration and Affairs is all about. So um, uh, on behalf of uh, Chancellor Nancy Cantor, I'm quite uh, delighted. Uh, she's actually making a presentation across town now, um, I'm quite delighted to, um, to welcome you to speak to us about bipartisanship. Uh, and I hope that one of the things that we will take away from this is uh, uh, that we uh, have the challenge and the opportunity to do this thing better than, than is currently being, uh, being done by the folks who represent us, because uh, uh, there is going to be no way that we can take on the important challenges we face unless we tackle this problem of bipartisanship. So thank you very much, Congressman Klein. I think, I think, uh, so let, let me ask uh, Edmund Janiger, who is the founding president of our Rutgers Council on Public and International Affairs, now to introduce the congressman. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Dean Holzer. Thank you, Provost Clear. Congressman Klein was born here in Newark. He earned his bachelor's degree at Rutgers University and his law degree at Harvard. He served the United States Air Force as a first lieutenant. He then earned a Master's of Taxation at New York University. Congressman Klein was first elected in 1972 to the New Jersey Legislature, representing the 35th District in the New Jersey General Assembly. He was chosen by his colleagues as the chairman of the Majority Caucus. Congressman Klein was the longtime executive director of the Passaic County Democratic Committee and a trustee of the Democratic National Committee. In 1992, he was elected to the United States House of Representatives from New Jersey's 8th District, succeeding the late Robert Rowe. He served on the House Banking and Science Committees. He was the architect of pivotal provisions that resolved problems in the savings and loans and thrift industry. He sanctioned interstate branch banking through his legislation and from it the pathway for American manufacturing to regain global control in manufacture, in um, global supremacy in manufacturing. Since leaving the House, Congressman Klein has crowned his distinguished career as senior partner in Noel Amoroso Klein Bierman. As a tri lawyer, Congressman Klein has made New Jersey legal history by winning one of the largest verdicts on behalf of an individual plaintiff. As a businessman, Congressman Klein is general partner in 20 private corporations and partnerships. 
including the first real estate investment trust of New Jersey. Congressman Klein has always been active at Rutgers. He served on the university's board of trustees. He's an overseer of the university foundation, chairing the President's Council and serving on the executive committee. He was also one of the inaugural members of the board of advisors of the Rutgers CPIA. On a personal note, Congressman Klein has been an inspiration to me, and I remain grateful to him for his continuing support of my endeavors. Now please join me in welcoming the Honorable Herbert C. Klein. Well, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, Edmund, uh, are, are you available to travel with me and make these introductions wherever I go? Because I thought it was a uh, quite an introduction. Thank you so very, very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here at the Rutgers School of Public Administration, and uh, I am particularly honored that uh, uh, Provost Clear and Dean Holter have seen fit to take time out of their busy days to join with us and spend some time. Uh, I think you should all be very proud to be a part of the School of Public Administration. Uh, I understand that you're one of the leading schools of this kind in the country, and indeed at the very, very top among public universities. Uh, this is the place where leaders are born, and the leaders of the future are going to come from the people who are students today at this school. And uh, I think it's a great endeavor for you. Keep at it and keep working at public administration and public policy because this country needs it. Um, as Dean Holzer said, and, he, and Provost uh, Clear as well, you can't do any worse than the guys who are there right now. They're doing a terrible job. You know, want to know how bad their job is? The latest poll showed that only 16% of the people approved of the work that Congress is doing. 16% is a pretty low approval rating. But I'll tell you, they've really come a long way because the months before that, they were down to 9%. Can you imagine that? I'll tell you about the only people that, excuse me. And we all have that problem. Excuse me. Uh, can you imagine that? And, and as a matter of fact, the only people that probably have less respect than Congress are used car salesmen. I was very, very fortunate to serve in Congress at a time when Congress got things done. And indeed, it did a Congress, at its best, can do a lot of great things for the country. During the period that I served, and not because of what I accomplished, but the Clinton economic and tax legislation was passed and ended a period of recession and served as springboard for the country's greatest period of economic growth in the past 40 years. I served on the Banking Committee, and some of the things we did on the Banking Committee, I think it was alluded to uh, a little earlier, the savings institution, the savings bank industry was in terrible shape. There had been 
dozens of savings banks throughout the country that had gone out of business. And there were many more that were threatened. And what it looked like was that there was going to be the end of the savings bank industry during the period that I served on the Banking Committee. And nobody would do anything about it because Republicans and Democrats alike uh, were of the opinion that we had already poured a lot of money down the rat hole and they didn't want to spend any more. How to solve the problem? Well, I was able to find some money that had been appropriated previously for the savings industry and had never been spent. And so I went to the Department of the Treasury and I said, you know, if we could use all of this money, wouldn't that solve the problem? And they said, yes, I think it would solve the problem, but you've got to get Republicans to co-sponsor it. So I went to some of the leaders on the Republican side of the Banking Committee, and together we sponsored legislation to use this money, and we saved the savings bank industry. Some of the greatest accomplishments that can come from public service in Congress is constituent service. And uh, I hope you'll forgive me for to digress to a little personal experience in that regard. One day I received a call from a woman who was a constituent, and in panic she said, my sister was murdered just two days ago by her husband. And worse than that, he took their two children and has absconded to Jordan, and I am afraid that those kids will never come back to the United States. Isn't there something you can do about it? Well, in one of the great strokes of luck, the King of Jordan, King Hussein, was coming to the United States the very next day, and he was the guest of honor at a luncheon at the Capitol to which I had been invited. So at the luncheon, I got up from my seat, wandered over to the head table, and said, Your Majesty, I am the congressman of Mrs. So-and-so who was killed by her husband and whose husband took his ch the children and took them to Jordan, and I'd like to talk to you about having the children you get the children to return to the United States. And very frankly, as I left the lunch and I said, I'll probably never hear from him again. But lo and behold, later that afternoon, I got a telephone call from the staff, and this was on a Tuesday, and the staff said, Thursday morning at 11.30, be at the King's hotel, the Four Seasons, at 11.30 on Thursday morning, and the King will meet with you. And I was joined by Senator Lautenberg and Sen Senator Bill Bradley and uh, Congressman Bob Torricelli. And as we were waiting in the ante room, uh, we said, well, how much time do you think he'll give us? And the wager was anywhere between five minutes and seven minutes. We got ushered inside, and after we made the introductions, I said, Your Majesty, as the congressman for Mrs. — and I don't want to use her name uh, — we are very concerned about these children. They were born here in the U.S. They've lived their entire young lives in the U.S. 
They're Americans in every way, and they ought to be back here. But I understand that it may be Islamic law that is a husband murders his wife because he believes that the ch she is not bringing up the children in the Muslim religion, that that's justifiable homicide. And the king looked at his legal advisor, and he said, the king said, that's not the law in Jordan, is it? And the legal advisor very dutifully said, no, your majesty, that's not the law in Jordan. And he turned to me, the king turned to me, and he said, you have my commitment that these children will be returned to the United States. We thought that was the end of the meeting. The king kept us there for an hour and a half, and we talked about all sorts of things, including his invitation that we should come to Jordan. So Senator Lattenberg and I, who were both Jewish, said, Your Majesty, you know, we're Jewish and we don't think that uh, members of the Jewish faith are welcome in Jordan. He said, oh, no. He said, we have Israelis come there often. He said, not only are you welcome, I want you to come and I want you to be my guest. We concluded the meeting, and we thought we had accomplished a great deal and still felt that there was going to be a lot of obstacles before the kids were actually returned to the U.S. We didn't know how great the obstacles would be, nor did the king himself, because what neither of us knew is that the husband who had murdered his wife and t taken the children away was a member of a group that included the head of the Air Force, his brother was the head of the Air Force, and were part of the king's personal royal guard. And so the king had the difficulty of having to overcome the resistance from this very, very influential family. But the king was a man of his word, and he persevered and kept at it. And we, I would call uh, his staff in Jordan every day for three weeks, and then one day, lo and behold, we got a call, and they said, the children are on their way to the U.S. They are in the king's personal plane. They're en route to Cyprus. From there, they're going to Germany, and you can meet them tomorrow at 1 p.m. at Newark Airport. And he was a man of his word. We met these kids at Newark Airport. The king had used the services of other members of his personal royal guard to come to the house where they were kept, which, by the way, was their grandmother's house, was being used as a safe house to keep them. He had used, the king had used the services of other royal guards loyal to him who secreted the kids, took them, put them on his own private plane, and sent them over to the U.S. So it was a great, a great day for these kids who now, I will tell you, are still very loyal American citizens. Well, I've talked to you about a period when things were good, when there was cooperation between Democrats and Republicans. But I will also tell you that there have been periods of gridlock in the past, not just the one that we are now experiencing. During the entire century, 
before FDR became president, it was virtually impossible to get things done in Congress. The Senate was an impenetrable barrier to moving progress. When FDR came along in his first term, he was able to move a tremendous amount of progressive legislation. And then at the start of his second term, because he had been frustrated by the Supreme Court, which had found much of that legislation to be unconstitutional, FDR decided that he was going to increase the number of members of the Supreme Court and then would appoint people to the court so that he would have a majority and his legislation would receive favorable approval by the Supreme Court. So-called court-packing legislation. Well, Southern Democrats and conservative Republicans using the filibuster banded together and they stopped the court packing legislation. But even worse, they found that they had been so successful with that legislation that they formed a coalition and continued from that point forward to be to obstruct virtually all progressive legislation. And indeed, that period continued right into the Kennedy years. Uh, until President Kennedy was assassinated, there was virtually no legislation during his term that moved through Congress. Um, when Johnson became president, his legislative skills did enable to, him to break the logjam, and they were able to move forward. And for a period of time, indeed leading up until the period when I was in Congress, and I must say it was, uh, things were good then, but then Newt Gingrich came along, and Newt Gingrich had a theory, and his theory was that if the Republicans were going to get control of Congress, they first had to destroy the institution. And he set about doing that very thing. He set about on a policy, a program of damaging and uh, criticizing and attacking the institution and the leadership. And I must say, sad to say, is that that has continued and that problem and that atmosphere continues until this very day. Now, in the period when I served, there was an atmosphere of collegiality, of camaraderie, of people liking each other, working with each other. Indeed, um, even uh, during periods when there was gridlock as a result of uh, the coalition of Southern Democrats and Republicans, there was still that, that atmosphere of at least liking each other. That gridlock was primarily rooted in simply a preservation of conservative ideas and values and conservative institutions. That's what they were, that was their motivation, that was their desire. The gridlock today and the partisan strife today is much deeper 
and there's much more poisonous. It really is based upon a feeling that we've got to attack the other side. We've got to damage the other side. We've got to damage not only the Congress and members of the Congress, we've got to damage the President. And indeed, that's what happened. That was, they did a lot of personal damage toward President Clinton. And there was a great deal of personal damage that is being done today to President Obama. Not just on issues of substance, but on purely personal issues. Indeed, the, uh, uh, the uh, it extends to the point where they literally will uh, spike themselves. Uh, they will, as the saying goes, cut off their noses to spite their face. One very classic and very sad example of that came um, with Homeland Security. Recently, uh, you'll all remember that the Homeland Security legislation, the funding of Homeland Security was before the Congress. And yet, even though everyone knew, including the people on both sides of the aisle, everyone knew that it was absolutely essential that we fund Homeland Security, and Homeland Security was essential to the very protection of this country. What they did was they, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the legislation was blocked solely for the purpose of punishing President Obama for the, for the, uh, the work that he had done on immigration, They've, to attack him for that very reason. It is a very sad and unfortunate situation. But that's where we are today. In the past two decades, Congress has increasingly been unable to overcome these partisan differences and unable to work together. Indeed, in the past three Congresses, we have set records for unproductivity, as we all know, and the country has suffered. Now, there are many theories and explanations as to why we have this. But whatever the reason may be, we must get past this. Unfortunately, there are no panaceas. But there are some. There is a light a little brightness at the end of the tunnel, perhaps. About eight years ago, a group called the Bipartisan Policy Center was formed. Its two co-chairs are two former Senate majority leaders, Trent Lott, a Republican, and Tom Daschle, a Democrat. The group includes a number of former members of Congress. Uh, one of them, for example, is Senator Olympia Snow, who, although was, she was a very, very successful member of the Senate, she decided not to run for re-election because she was, felt that there was nothing that she could accomplish in the Senate because of the bipartisan policies. She was a Republican, uh, a very wonderful person. We're glad to see that Olympia Snow is now working with the Bipartisan Policy Center, and I'm proud that I'm part of that group. 
What the bipartisan policy center does is to focus on important legislative issues and bills which we believe are have bipartisan support and are important to the country. And what we do is we set about to improve the political environment to make it more conducive to a bipartisan approach to our nation's policy make making. The Bipartisan Policy Center works with Republicans and Democrats to develop lasting solutions to the key problems facing the nation. What sets it apart from other think tanks is that we bring together all sides, regardless of party affiliation or position, when we tackle a problem. We combine politically balanced policy making with strong, proactive advocacy and outreach. Our solutions come from a process of rigorous analysis, reason, negotiation, and respective dialogue. It was originally founded by Senate Majority, former Senate Majority Leader Howard Baker, uh, and also uh, other Majority Leaders, Tom Daschle, Bob L Dole, George Mitchell, since then, BBC has recruited talented leaders, including many former elected officials, business leaders, academics, and advocates from all sides of the political spectrum to work together to create policy solutions. We're probably the only Washington, D.C.-based think tank that actively promotes bipartisanship. We try to tackle America's most critical issues. Currently, our focus is on health, energy, national and homeland security, the economy, housing, immigration, and governance. In the area of governance, one of the things we've been focusing on is trying to eliminate or at least reduce the effect of gerrymandering in creating congressional districts because the gerrymandering process, that is the creation of congressional districts, has resulted in most congressional districts being predominantly either extreme right-wing Republican or extreme left-wing Democratic. And as a result, members from those districts no, they can't be defeated. They know and feel that they have to take extreme positions in order to protect their position. And that is not the way to accomplish the passage of important legislation. Because in order to have legislation passed it takes people working together. It takes compromise. It takes a, it takes putting together pieces so that they are a whole that is acceptable to a majority of the people. And that's the way you get good bipartisan legislation. Um, at BBC, our projects, our task forces, 
our experts work tirelessly to find consensus, consensus-driven policy solutions. But our effort doesn't stop there. PPC is committed to seeing its policy solutions enacted into law. And through the Bipartisan Policy Center Advocacy Network, we engage in lobbying, strategic outreach, outreach to bolster the Legislative Center and unite Republicans and Democrats on polarizing issues. We work to help get bipartisan sponsorship for legislation that is important. We work to lobby for the passage of these bills. And with our very strong and competent full-time professional staff, we do the research that will support and energize the passage of these bills. Still, it's not easy. It's very slow going. The victories come, but very slowly and quietly. We Focus also on changing the method for structuring elections. Finally, we try to, uh, we work hard in the area of reducing the impact of money on politics. Because the more money that goes into congressional races, the less chance there is for bipartisan agreement on that legislation. Hopefully over a period of time, with the help of all Americans, and with all of Americans not only being dissatisfied with what Congress is doing today, but being dissatisfied enough to go out and vote to change the system, hopefully we will be able to effect the change for the better. But major change can only come with the support of all of us, with the support of congressional leadership, with the support of members of Congress, and most of all, the support of the American public. Only then will we get a Congress that focuses not on how to make political capital for the next election, but instead on how we can work together in the spirit of compromise and bipartisanship and then the pursuit of legislative goals for the good of the country. I thank you all very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. Yes. Well, first of all, let's talk about the filibuster. I absolutely agree with you that if the filibuster would, were to be eliminated, that would make things easier to accomplish.
do I think the filibuster can be eliminated in the near future? Uh, I, I doubt it very much. I, I think that the filibuster is so ingrained today in uh, the tradition of the Senate and in the prerogatives that individual senators have that I don't think they're going to give it up. Uh, can it be reduced, its impact reduced? Yeah, I, I think it can, and I think you're going to see, hopefully, some changes in the next several years uh, which will reduce the impact of the filibuster. But I don't think you're going to see the elimination of it. Uh, the other, I'm sorry, the other. Well, the, there's no reason why we should have the problems that we have today with approval of appointments. Um, the idea, the Constitution says <coughs> that all uh, appointments are with the advice and consent of the Senate. That doesn't mean that the Senate can simply sit on appointments and do nothing. <coughs> and unfortunately, there's been a lot of that. Um, the problem really exists in the Senate rules. You know, I, I remember uh, when I was first elected to uh, Congress, uh, I was sitting at lunch with uh, a brand new senator, and we were chatting, and I said, uh, are you getting accustomed to your role in the Senate? He said, it's very easy to get accustomed to your role in the Senate. You only have to learn one word. I said, oh, what's that word? He said, the word is no. Any senator can stop legislation simply by saying no, and the le that puts a hold on the legislation. And for example, in the case of presidential appointments, he can put a no on any presidential appointment. Now, uh, fortunately, uh, there aren't too many situations in which uh, senators use it indiscriminately, but when they want to use it, they use it. And uh, it's, uh, I, I don't see that one changing at all. Well, let, let me ask a question. Yes, um, yes Dean. Do you think that the underlying conflict here is not so much power, but it's between those who believe in fact-based decision-making on one side and those who believe in faith-based decision I think with the present, with the present makeup of the Congress, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to reconcile it. Uh, the uh, the Tea Party crowd in the House uh, seems to be totally oblivious to the cause of seeing the past. Uh, passage of legislation. They don't see that as a goal. They see as a goal only stopping the passage of any legislation that doesn't meet their extreme positions. And I must say that there are some Democrats who are far to the left <coughs> who may also have that attitude. Uh, and those, those <laughs> folks particularly the Tea Party folks in the House, uh, simply will not vote uh, for any legislation that doesn't meet their 
extreme ideological standards. And that's a bad situation. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes. I think that, uh, yeah, I, and I think the way it works is that the more a candidate or an office holder receives in the way of financial contributions from one particular side, uh, there's a tendency to take positions that are supportive of that side. Uh, and uh, when the issues involved are partisan in, in nature, um, you definitely get a partisan result that is achieved as a result of the money that's injected into it. Uh, a perfect example might be uh, uh, the gun lobby. Gun lobby puts, uh, injects a lot of money <coughs> into a lot of congressional campaigns, presidential campaigns, and the congressmen who receive that money uh, will not deviate from the position of the gun lobby on gun lobby issues. So you <coughs> can't get a bipartisan solution to most issues that the, bun that the gun lobby cares about and supports. Well, <laughs> I, I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, it can only happen two ways. Uh, uh, if the composition of the Supreme Court changes, uh, yes, I think it will change. Uh, other than that, it would take uh, a Legis legislation that I don't think this Congress, as it exists right now, would vote for. Any other uh, questions? Well, I thank you all, and uh, I wish you all a good day, and keep up the good fight. Thank you.